So welcome to uh, this uh, session that I put together. Originally, kind of a summary for one of the clients that was a I was helping with and had some uh, questions about Azure Data Factory and the Synapse pipelines. So I kind of put this together, it became, you know, I, I found it, I like it. <laughs> so I made it uh, polish a little bit better. And this is the second time I'm uh, presenting this uh, particular content. So I hope everything, all the demos will work fine as they did in the first one. Uh, once again, my name is Armando Lacerda, uh, Microsoft MVP, Microsoft uh, Certified Trainer. I hold a ton of, uh, of certifications and been taking Microsoft certifications for a very long time. So yeah, so our, our agenda is going to be pretty simple. I don't have much slide decks, but uh, uh, much slides on this slide deck, but I have uh, a lot of uh, demos to show to you and uh, make the comparisons. The, the first topic of the agenda is going to be this, uh, this scalability points. Um, and, and the background of this presentation is like, Microsoft introduced uh, the uh, very first version of SQL Server Integration Service back in SQL Server 7.0 in 2000, and back then it was called uh, a DTS. And if no, I don't know if, you're, uh, if you were around back then, but um, uh, Data Transformation Service was the original name of what, uh, of what we know as of today as a SQL Server Integration Service. And uh, back then I was already working on some data transformations. And today we call people who you know, implement these data transformations as data engineers. But back then it was just like the DBA tried to work on the database and get things uh, uh, transformed. Uh, used to do PL SQL in Oracle and then moving to SQL Server when it became SQL Server 7.0. And I started working there like over 20 years ago with DTS and then in 2005 when SSS came along. So with the cloud age that pretty much started in, in, as a general available uh, technology back in 2010, a little bit earlier than 2010, uh, and all the, the gig about data engineering, the new things coming up, I was like, you know, great, going to have integration service up in the cloud. But no, we did it. <laughs> we didn't get integration service up in the cloud. And uh, to be honest, I was a little bit frustrated at, the fir at first. And um, finally, after some conversations with people there at Microsoft, when we went there for some events, uh, they got, uh, they finally got me to understand the, the, the problem with the scalability. So that's the first po point we'll be uh, looking together. Why integration service is not an option for uh, cloud computing for ETL or ELT in the cloud. Of course, there are ways to run integration service in the cloud. That's not what I'm saying, right? <laughs> there are ways to do integration service in, in the cloud. But um, uh, the point is uh, we're going to see the, the, the things about scalability. And we're going to... Uh, make the bridge kind of make the the transition of what we see in integration service and what we're going to see in the cloud what we're going to see in synapse so that's the bridge going up there and then the uh the samples are going to run the samples actually kind of going to mix in between these slides and the samples as i move along uh feel free to uh, ask questions you may ask questions on the chat window we're going to have the q a at the at the end of the presentation so once we finish it here we go back and check it out. I, I, I believe Mark is, both Marks <laughs> are take a look at the uh, at the, the chat window for, for me. So here we go. <laughs> SQL Server Integration Service, SSIS, it was designed to work closed to SQL Server because the integration service itself, it doesn't do data management. SQL Server does. So SQL Server is our management engine, a data management engine, or the data engine, while integration service uh, is, a, is a processing tool, a processing element that talks to SQL and talks, probably have heard that, that line before, it talks to any data source and to any data destination. So the idea was always uh, extract, transform, and uh, load, right? Extract, transform, and load. And the, the, the sources for extract, transform, and load could be any source or any destination. Like in this particular uh, uh, rendering here, I have SQL Server. Oops, let me get my laser point coming up here. There we go. I have uh, uh, three SQL servers here as a server, uh, as sources, and I have another SQL Server here uh, as a destination. But the bottom line here, you could, uh, you know, we can have multiple, so multiple different types of sources, right? Multiple kinds of sources. We can have SQL, we can have Oracle, we can have flat files, we can have more 
complex files like Excel data types, and there are you know dozens of data sources we can use over here, and multiple destinations we can write to the same way. That is not the point. The source and the destination is not the point. The point leaves, you know, the, the, the whole conversation leaves around here, this area here. What's the problem with the, that particular tier or the actual computing of the transformation? First is that integration service is designed to work better when it's connected to SQL. Uh, you know, we, we know that integration service can run as a, a standalone pr uh, process, right? And writes to the file system of the server where it's connected to. But in order to do that, you still need to have a SQL license. You, you have to, uh, you know, buy SQL in order to have a SQL Server integration service. But if you do have an integration service working uh, connected to SQL, to act, uh, an actual SQL service, SQL instance, and create its own database in there, you have more monitoring, you have extra perks you get in order to track the activities that uh, integration service is doing, right? So bottom line is uh, integration service works better when you have SQL Server. And that creates a problem in terms of scalability. How much data can you move from these sources to the destination if you are constrained to a particular process and to a particular service connected to that process. That is the problem of scalability. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, actually, I haven't seen that implemented in production. I know there are uh, some implementations out there, but I haven't seen the customers that have helped. But um, th there is a, an option in, in integration service to spread out the load of um, uh, in a package, like you can have a package, you can have an orchestrator like this uh, SSIS here, and you could have other SSIS running in other servers. And uh, you can, you know, you can dispatch packages to run in other services, they do their work in there, and then they come back. So you kind of get some extra scalability in there. But the bottom line is, even though you are orchestrating this package to go to other servers, and they're gonna run on the other services resources. The actual package that's running the on that particular resource is also <laughs> uh, constrained, you know, limited by whatever that server is, you know, whatever uh, computing capability of that server is. I cannot. Here's the point. I cannot. We cannot get one package and get the same source to be processed by that one package definition into multiple compute nodes. That operation integration service does, does not support. And that is the point of scalability. We can scale out, but we can, uh, uh, yeah, we can scale out, but we cannot scale up a particular project or a particular package, I'd rather say. So, so the, that's the whole deal. That's why integration service uh, never made it to the cloud as a cloud service. Like we have SQL Server on premise, we have SQL Server in the cloud, uh, we have Office, uh, used to have right Office on premise. Now everything is Office in the cloud, although we can install Office on, uh, on premise. And there are some other services that made the same way, right? We have SharePoint online, we have SharePoint on premise, but integration service itself, uh, we don't have it, right? We report service, for instance, in SQL. Uh, they they uh, took away reporting service from SQL Server as a service, and they gave it to Power BI, right? We have paginated reports in Power BI, which are pretty much reporting service, right? The same, the same RDL definition. So um, almost all other services, they made their way to the cloud, but you don't have an option for integration service. And why we don't have the option? Because there is this limitation of compute scalability. If we think about it, um, we there are multiple designs that uh, they all um, you know converge to this particular bl blueprint here in terms of how you do ETL and in scale, right? You, how you do ETL at scale, and the idea of doing ETL at scale, the the blueprint, the baseline of doing ETL at scale, is by uh, putting apart just uh, by separating the storage and the compute. 
you put them apart and you connect them to some sort of controller, login nodes, and of course, network connectivity. So the whole thing is SQL Server Integration Service is one process integrated to the engine, to the data engine, and that must be uh, broken apart, right? You get put that apart. And if you do that, if you break that apart, you should be able to have as many compute nodes. Let me switch here this quick. As many compute nodes as you need. And those compute nodes should be able to uh, simultaneously, in parallel, go into the uh, storage, into the, where the data lives, into, into the storage. If you think about this, you have seen this before. I mean, if you have been around uh, around SQL Server technology for a while, um, not long ago, uh, you probably have seen this design here. And um, let me, I forgot to load here my zoom in. Let me get my zoom in here this quick. There we go. Zoom in. Where's my mouse? Mouse is over here. Mouse, mouse is over here. Let me get that close here. So you have probably seen this uh, this design here before um, for Microsoft documentation. This is the former uh, PDW, right? The Parallel Data Warehousing uh, for SQL Server when uh, when implemented on premise. Um, a lot of companies too run this because they have invested a lot. You know, the entry level for this one here was about two million dollars just to get started. And if you look through this one here, it's pretty much an implementation of that or that design I had on this slide deck uh, on the slide before, right in the previous slides. What you're seeing here is multiple storage, as you can see over here. There are multiple storage nodes. These are NAS on premise, that, of course, and there are multiple SQL Server servers. So this database service here is the compute. As you can see, uh, there are, I think, the minimum to get started is like ten. Um, and you get a spare, of course, but there are like 10 of them. And they, uh, when the data comes in, each one of them uh, handles a particular partition of the data. So when a query runs, uh, the query can be distributed to all the nodes that hold the portion of the data that's being queried. And then we can have parallel processing. Real, that's the name of the product, right? Parallel data, uh, data warehousing. So we can have the uh, uh, slices being queried in parallel and then is stitched together by the uh, by the management management servers. These guys here and the control nodes, right? Get the information uh, got together and sent back to the clients. So this design here is an implementation that used to be from on premise. This for on premise back on the days when we do that on premise using SQL Server um, as the the data engine to deal with the data. Where is SSIS? Well, SSIS would be one of your client applications. You see, they have the client drivers, drivers that send uh, information, uh, send queries to uh, to the cluster, right, to the PDW platform, and your uh, ETL load interface would be one of your one of these clients. I'm getting the mouse out of there. Would be one of these clients. And the information that would come out would land on a particular place where the ETL would send. But the bottom line here, and it's a very subtle detail that I need you to, to capture, is this. Even when it was on premise, SSIS was just an orchestrator, a client of the actual compute behind, uh, behind the data processing. And the data, if you really want that massive data processing, it, should, it must be, it has to be uh, inside SQL Server, inside the data platform. It cannot be outside the data platform. And uh, you would have to work with the data here inside the SQL database in order to have that parallelism. Otherwise, uh, we go back to the, the two slides ago, we go back to one process dealing with the data that's uh, being transferred over. So SSIS has never been uh, the, the best tool to do data transformations at scale. Even when it when it was on premise, when it was on premise, it was SQL Server, as you can see uh, from this uh, uh, original uh, slide design here from Microsoft. So that's why we cannot stay with uh, uh, integration service, right? This first collection of slides I named it like this 
We cannot stay with integration service because it doesn't scale. It's not designed for the cloud. Uh, the, the whole process distribution is not designed for the cloud. What we need is something like this. And there were other people out there doing uh, some experiments, some implementations uh, with other technologies. There, there were exactly this, uh, following this, this particular pattern, which Microsoft did on premise again, like I mentioned. And before Synapse came around in 2019, Microsoft moved uh, or implemented this particular platform here in the cloud as a service platform as a service call, uh, and the name was uh, Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So if you were around back then, <laughs> you probably have heard about Azure SQL Data Warehouse. I was there, I had a lot of fun. Uh, we did some projects together here with Design Mind on that one. And um, um, it, was, it was a great product. But back in 2019, Microsoft designed to integrate that product, that service, right? Now everything's called service. <laughs> Microsoft designed to integrate that service with other services. They're all uh, uh, involved somehow in data processing, data transformation, uh, data crunching, and reporting. So they put all the, 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 the products together and came up with uh, Synapse. So Synapse, Azure Synapse, is not actually one service, it's a collection of multiple services inside, inside, uh, inside itself, right? It's a, an umbrella name. One of the services that's in there is the former, this implementation here, the former Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which is now named uh, the dedicated SQL pool. So what do you see on this slide deck right now, this picture here? It's, uh, you know, with some modifications, of course, is what, uh, runs what supports uh, the dedicated SQL pool inside Synapse. But it, again, if this thing here, right, if this platform here is the uh, dedicated SQL pool inside Synapse, who is doing the ETL, right? Who is doing uh, the data transformation at scale, like a client for this guy here, or running the process out there? So the element doing that is uh, another service inside Synapse called the transformation pipelines. So if I switch here just quick to the Azure portal, and let me get the Azure portal a little bigger in here so you can see that. Uh, where is it? This one. I'm getting myself smaller here in the corner. And if I go here uh, to Synapse, uh, if I go here, uh, so Again, if you're, just, just make sure you're on the same page. This is the uh, Azure portal, right? This is where you, you manage services. In order to work with Synapse and data transformation in the cloud, you don't need access to the portal. I'm just showing here the portal uh, just for you to know that I have created a couple of resource groups in here with some samples that will be running on. And my Synapse is right down here, right? This guy here is the service that I, uh, I have created for this, uh, for this demo. So when I click on this guy here, I get a link to open Synapse Studio, which I already have it open over here. So I got a link for Synapse Studio, and in here is where I find all the services inside Synapse. So when I, uh, if I go here into the management, I can see here in the management that I have the SQL pools. There are two types of SQL pools. One uh, I already mentioned is the dedicated SQL pool. So if I click here on new, uh, I have the option to create a dedicated SQL pool, which is the implementation of that uh, parallel data warehouse service uh, used to have on premise in the cloud, as I mentioned before. I'm not going to need this one today because data transformation doesn't have to be done in here. So I'm going to leave this alone. Uh, we have the, uh, the dedicated SQL pool, and we always have what they call a serverless SQL pool. And the serverless SQL pool is a very inter interesting service. I mean, you know, I use this a lot in my projects, but it's going to be a talk for another day, right? They're going to keep it on the side here. Otherwise, it's going to take too long. <clears throat> um, the other data engines we have around Synapse uh, is this one here. It's the Microsoft, Microsoft on Apache Spark implementation. So this service here, it's not a third-party software. It's not implementation from somebody else. This is micro, it's a fork that Microsoft got from the Apache project and implemented its own Spark engine uh, in order to be integrated within the Synapse environment. Why I'm saying that? Because if I go back here into the Azure portal, 
And uh, let me see, I'm in the uh, resource group that I have created for this guy here. Here to the resource group for this demo, this session today. So if I go here and ask to create, uh, ask to work with Databricks, Azure Databricks, Databricks is another Spark engine that exists inside Azure. So Azure as a Microsoft platform supports more than one actually <laughs> uh, Spark engines. One, the original one from Databricks, you know, they, they, they were the ones who invented the, the technology and made the technology, uh, most of it public, right, in the, uh, the Apache, uh, Apache project. And uh, of course, they keep the secret sauce for themselves. So if I go here and create a uh, Databricks, I will have pretty much the same idea, right, in, gen uh, in, in, in general terms, we would have the same uh, uh, Spark, uh, Spark engine running outside Synapse, running Databricks. So you have two competing services uh, uh, in Azure doing the same thing. That's the one inside Synapse, the other one inside Databricks. Why I'm mentioning this? Because data, uh, Spark as a, as a uh, uh, data engine was developed or uh, envisioned, where right? it was first designed for developers. So when you work with the Spark, straight with the Spark, you have to write code. Now, for us coming from uh, integration service, we are familiar with uh, the integration service tools, right? If I go back, if I go here to Visual Studio, which I have opened beforehand with a package, a sample package from uh, the sample database from Microsoft. So if I go here into Visual Studio and start working with integration service and start doing my data transformations, I'm familiar with this, right? I'm familiar with uh, uh, coming into the toolbox and looking to the control flow. Oh, it's too initializing. Okay, we give it a lot of, another moment. <laughs> so I go here, there to the toolbox. I bring my my uh, my tasks into the control flow, and I bring my bring my data transformations into the data flow. Get the elements in here that I mean, whatever I need to do. Get them in here. I'm familiar with this, and if I have to write code. Uh, which I don't want to. <laughs> there are some places in there where I can write some code, but the idea, I don't want to do coding, right? This one here is the idea of, uh, in the way I have my elements and this, I just stitch them together. And we're going to go back to this one here to see these things in details. Now, the Spark uh, engine, like, let me go back here to the portal. That is my portal over here. There we go. So uh, back to the portal, if I look into the, the Spark engine, the Spark engine was not designed for that. The Spark engine was actually designed for developers. So if I want to do something with the uh, Spark engine, I would have to come here into the develop tab, or yeah, I think they call it tab <laughs> in, uh, in Azure Synapse or uh, the same thing in uh, Databricks. And from here, I would create a notebook. So I would come here into the notebook and here in the notebook, I would start writing code. Uh, let me get out of the way here. And see, it's asking for something. Nope, just show the properties. Back in there, all right. So here, uh, as you can see here, uh, the default language I was selected when I created a notebook was by Spark. And I, I have options for language in here. I could do, because I'm Microsoft Platform, C Sharp is an option there. It wouldn't be an option in Databricks. But a uh, uh, Python by Spark or you know Spark SQL I can do, and here I would go you know, work my codes, meaning I you know uh, doing import of some library and so on. Uh, meaning there is no uh, visual elements to work with. So for DBAs, they are used to do data transformations and integration service. This one here is a too, <laughs> too big of a leap to get in there. So what Microsoft came up with when they uh, came in Azure, when this thing was translated to Azure, is to uh, have a uh, another service on top of this that we are seeing here right now. This particular one is the Spark engine for the Spark notebook. I don't have a, a, uh, a cluster yet. I have to create a cluster here, I think. But um, you know, I, the idea is to have uh, a sort of a wizard or a better, a better interface, a graphic user interface that would kind of resemble what we have in the data tools in Visual Studio for 
uh, SSIS. With that idea in mind, what Microsoft came up with is uh, this one here is data factory, Azure Data Factories. So this particular service, Azure Data Factory, it does ETL, the idea of this more than ETL, the orchestration, there's a bunch of other things, but the compute behind this one here is actually Databricks. So if I come and create a data factory and start uh, doing data, uh, defining my data transformations inside data factory, I'm, I, everything that I'm doing there is, is it will be translated, it's going to be translated into some Scala or Python code that will run on top of Databricks. So when you do data factory, you're actually doing Databricks. But if you are doing Synapse, we are, you are actually doing the Spark pool for Synapse uh, for the Synapse service. And what is known as Data Factory outside Synapse, in Synapse is called the integration Integrated Pipeline. So here in the Integrated Pipeline, what we have again is a graph user interface on top of this Spark pool that we have just seen here uh, for, uh, that would be supporting this notebook. So this, uh, this um, service inside Synapse, the in, uh, integrated pipeline, is what would be our next level of SSIS, our integration service. Bottom line, let me go back here to the other uh, screen. This one. Bottom line in here, uh, what is it here? Bottom line in here is I had a uh, spark boom. Let me get here, blackboard here just quick. Like this. So we have Databricks and Synapse. Inside Synapse, we have the transformation integration, rather. And the screen is wobbling a little bit. Sorry about that. There we go. Nope. Integration pipeline. These two guys here, they are based on Spark. The Spark, uh, the, the, the concept of a Spark engine uh, is common to both. Each one of them is a specialized implementation of the Spark engine. Uh, and for uh, the for the service outside uh, Synapse, you have Azure, Azure Data Factory that is based on this guy here, right? On Databricks. That's the, uh, the, the final uh, the, uh, landscape definition, right? That's how the land, <laughs> the way of the land inside Synapse, inside Azure. So we can go either here and here or here that is based, uh, like I mentioned, on this guy here. Uh, and for the rest of this presentation, we're going to focus on this one here uh, in the integration pipeline in Synapse for basically two reasons. One, because I'd rather use Synapse than the uh, Databricks because it's cheaper, right? Databricks has some uh, price overhead for the Databricks license. The second one is uh, Databricks is always ahead than Synapse. There is always something new, something specific inside Databricks. Uh, that Microsoft ends up uh, at some point will catch up uh, inside Synapse. But if I'm not living in the edge, right? If I'm doing regular data transformation with the regular uh, libraries that are out there, 90, 90, 95% of the kids out there can be uh, uh, implemented to use the regular Synapse integration pipeline. And one last thing is uh, both of them, uh, both Databricks and the integration pipelines inside Synapse, they're all based on the data lake and they, they share technology, both uh, regular Parquet files or the uh, Delta Lake with the Delta, Delta table. They are fully compatible with each other, which means that I can run all my transformations inside Synapse. And if there is an edge case that I can only implement using Databricks, I can point Databricks to the same uh lake to the same storage and they would share the same files which is in C which in sql is you cannot conceive that 
if that would be, to, uh, if we have to translate that into SQL, it would be like have SQL Server and some other process sharing the same MDF and NDF files with the transaction logs. So that is impossible, right, in SQL Server, but it does happen uh, inside Azure, inside uh, with uh, Databricks and Synapse. So with that in mind, uh, if you have any questions about all of this approach and you know these bridges and all of that, please keep uh, uh, posting your message, uh, your questions in the in the uh, chat, and I'll be back to the chat at the, in a few minutes, right? In about uh, 25 minutes. So let's go to some demos here and some bridges. So this is the bridge time. So you are an integration service person, right? You are the integration service guy, and now we've been promoted to data engineer. <laughs> You're going to do data transformation up in the cloud. But you are familiar with this, right? When you open integration service, you have the control flow engine, and you have the data flow engine, and you have the data flow inside the data flow engine. It's what I had here in the virtual machine. Let me get this guy back up. So there we go. Let me get this guy back up. There it is. And let me get this screen bigger. So this is what we have, right? We have the control flow and we have the data flow. Do we have these this two elements inside uh, the uh, integration pipelines inside Synapse? As a matter of fact, we do. So if I switch here back to the portal, and uh, not actually the portal, I rather uh, should say uh, the Synapse uh, Studio. This is called the Synapse Studio, Azure Synapse Studio. So if I go here inside the portal, what I see here is this, def oh, sorry, is this definition of the pipelines, the integrate pipelines. I don't have any at this moment. Let me close this notebook here. That was just, uh, just to show you uh, the elements of the notebook. <laughs> Uh, so let's go ahead and create, instead of creating a notebook, we are creating a pipeline. So notice that uh, as we move around, if I'm going to develop, I have options here that are uh, uh, related to the develop side of Synapse. So I can do SQL scripts for the dedicated SQL pool. I can do KQL for the data explorer. And so far, so notebooks, like I mentioned before, and data flows here too. I'm going to check, get to the data flow in a second. But if I want to do the graph user interface, not writing codes, so I go into the integrate, and here in the integrate, I will see here my pipeline. So I can go ahead and create a new pipeline. So when I create a pipeline, that is the idea, very close, <laughs> of an integration service package. So this would be one of my packages, because inside the package, like I have in the slide deck, let me get the slide deck here again, uh, when I have when I create a package in integration service, I have the control flow engine and the data flow engine, right? So that's the idea of this guy here. This is kind of a, the package that we have in integration service. And the, this canvas over here, the, this area over here, this canvas is my control flow. Everything that happens in here in the canvas is control flow. And uh, in my experience, helping other customers, you know, to come into Synapse or data, uh, Azure Data Factory and start doing data transformations, some uh, customers, they get a little frustrated because they look into this canvas here and they want to do data transformation right here in the, in the pipeline. That is not the case. And that translates exactly like, as you know, uh, in, in integration service. When you go into integration service, you cannot do data transformation in the control flow engine. You only do data transformation in the data flow uh, side of the package, right? Never in the control flow. Control flow is for or orchestration. And that's exactly what happens in here. So like if I'm going to move data from place to place without any transformations, just kind of move them or at minimal in some cases, I can just get you know, a copy data over here. And uh, this copy data would be connecting to a source and be writing to a destination. And of course, you know, job security, you always have to learn new terms to things you already know. <laughs> uh, in, in, the, in SSIS, we have a source and destination, right? Here we have source and sync. And the first time I, I, I saw the word in sync, and the first time I read it there, I was like, sync, why sync? And then it makes sense. We're talking about working with data lake in the cloud. 
So usually you want to save to the lake, so you're sinking <laughs> something into the lake. I think that's the mindset that was there when these guys started working with this. The bottom line this is the destination, but no data transformation. This is just copy things over. Uh, we do have something like that integration service, uh, SQL integration service, but the it's very uncommon to see this in integration service because you know you're already in the database, so you're transforming the data right there. You're either defining uh, uh, transformation in the package or as for procedure in the database. This is in the cloud, and because this is in the cloud, you have to remember to keep in mind that you. Oops, let me get back here. You have to remember. We have to keep in mind that you are in in the cloud. So there is a cloud resource in here. In the in this cloud resource, you have your data storage, like a data lake or something like that. And like we have seen in the design, I have my compute, uh, let's call here a cluster. I have my compute up in the cloud that wants to talk to the data. And here's the point, the cluster to transform data only works with the data that is already in the cloud. So if you have an on-premise environment, and there is a SQL server running on that on-premise environment or Oracle, whatever it is, and you want to have this cluster processing the data that's in here, first, you have to copy that data from whatever it is inside uh, the Azure Cloud, inside the uh, data lake or... Data lake is your best option, right? You don't want to have like SQL there storing your data or any other data engine, right? You really want to have a data lake. So because everything is uh, working in here in, in the lake and you can only transform data that's already in the lake, uh, you always have this copy activity going on in your control flow. So if I go back here to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Synapse Studio, usually you see tasks starting like this. You have, uh, you know, oops, sorry, mouse over here. You have uh, an orchestration of data uh, of data coming from some source to some destination. Um, if you are doing um, like re reading from uh, a web service, you know some uh, uh, web uh, source. You have controls for uh, reading from the web, like this one here. You can get some more real estate. I got this thing big, so you guys can read better. So let me collapse some stuff in here, so we can see things better. So you know from this one here. Uh, I could come in here and set it up for uh, uh, whatever uh, REST API is uh, uh, giving data, right? Presenting a data, uh, data, presenting a data set to me to the uh, engine, and then I could move on and uh, save it somewhere else. So there we go, right? This is my control flow. Back to this slide deck. Um, yeah, within the the Within integration service, we have this idea of uh, projects and packages within the projects. So if go back in here, just make sure you're on the same page. If go back here, looking at this guy here. I have here my uh, my project. See this uh, daily ETL here is my project, and within the project, I can have multiple packages. And this project within the project, I can have uh, packages orchestrating the execution of other packages. I could come here into the toolbox. Hopefully it's already there. Nope, still not there. Mm -hmm. Something happening here. Toolbox. Um, for some reason, my VM that is pinned up specifically for this session is not bringing up my toolbox. That's gonna bump. <laughs> but in any case, there, there, we do have some controls in here. And you know there are some of these controls in the toolbox that you can use to start other packages within your project, the project where it lives, or other packages in other projects. We have, So what happens in the control flow is actually orchestration, right? You can uh, call packages within and outside the project itself. The same thing you can do in uh, in integration pipelines. 
you can come here in Azure and you can uh, uh, invoke another pipeline. See? Hey, Armando, uh, Lisa uh, messaged you that you're in the standard toolbox, not the SSIS toolbox. Oh, yeah, that's true. See, long time not working with the thing. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, and Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, definitely. <laughs> So here, um, where should I, where do I get that one again? Let's see if I can put it in here. Oh. Can I, can you go to tools? Tools. Is it in tools? I thought it would be in view. Here's the toolbox, but I don't see the integration toolbox. Lisa, you are correct. Uh, there, is, there is a toolbox and there is a, the integration pipeline toolbox. Now, it should have shown there for me. Yeah, it's not even showing as I right click here. Should have shown in here in, it, in this place here for me. Don't know where it is. It must be something with the installation. Sometimes when these VMs, when they deploy these VMs, they need to run some updates. It's probably missing some updates. Let me close this and try to open it again, see if it pops up. This is trying to track it down in parallel with you, so we'll see yeah. who <laughs> wins the race. Uh. All right, so let's cancel this because you open 2012, uh, 2022, and Visual Studio 2022 does not support uh, integration service. It has to be 2019. So let's see if it works this time around. You can do it. I know you can do it. Search toolbox. Project is moved. Background tasks are still running. There's something still going on under the hood, and it's probably loading the, this toolbox in here. Yeah, but it's not not, not really important uh, that important for uh, for this demo. We can live without it. So the bottom line is, if you have your integration you service right for top you, corner? say that again. Can you try, try the right side top corner toolbox icon? The right side. Right side. Right side on the top. You have toolbox icon. This one here? No, no. Move left, left, left. Right. Left, oh, left, files, left, files. left, 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 left. Again, left. Few more blocks. Left. This one? one? Yeah. Aha. My man. Thank you. You okay. can have an extra pizza slice next time Mark puts this together. Okay, it's on Mark. <laughs> it's, it's a team ex, it's a team effort. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. So yeah, so in here, right, you have these guys. You see, you have execute a package task. You can send to some uh, someone else uh, another package. Um uh, or process outside uh, uh outside the integration service. So yeah, so this whole thing here. It's all about um, orchestrating, and and again, thank you, uh, <laughs> uh, Lisa. Right, and the other gentleman who just showed me that toolbox there too. <laughs> Didn't catch your name. Sorry. It's me, Arti. So, say it again. Ati. Arvi, thank you, Arvi. Ati, Ati, H I. Ati. Ati. All right, thank you. So yeah, so this is the integrate uh, the control flow and the integration. Uh, exactly like uh, in a, uh, you have an in integration service. Uh, if we, if I move back here to this slide deck, exactly like when you have integration service, you stitch these things together using flow elements, right? You you, you have a task, that task uh, will connect to the next task, and it could be conditional connection. If it succeeds, you do one thing. If it doesn't succeed, you do something else. Uh, regardless if succeeded or not, you you do something else, uh, you, you know, another thing, <laughs> right? Just on completion. So the same uh, uh, the same approach that we have in integration service, which we can see here uh, in Visual Studio, 
right? Like uh, in this one here, this uh, task will be done if this first one here complete, uh, uh, succeeds, right? When it complete and when it completes and succeeds. If I want to do something else in case it fails, I could just grab another uh, task in here and say that I want to get this guy here. And this guy is when it fails. Hey there, there we go. So it goes like that here in uh, integration service. The same thing, the same, exactly the same approach uh, happens in uh, the uh, Synapse integration pipeline. So if I go back in here, I have already three, three of my tasks in here. So let's say that uh, if this uh, uh, web process here is able to load some um, you know, CSV files from uh, some source, so I want to do the copy data from that CSV file to someplace else without data transformation. And in case it fails, I want to come on. I want to add another one here. Or in case it failed, it fails. And get this guy. Whoops. <laughs> connected over here. And now I have crossed the wires there, but you got the idea, right? Oops. I don't have much space in this. Let me decrease this here a little bit. There we go. Better. Let me get this guy down here. Okay. So you see the exact the same idea. If you are an integration service person, you are not too far from uh, working and defining your flows and the elements you want to uh, get done here. Just keep in mind that your pipeline is your orchestration element. And you are in a different environment, so you're not going to have the exactly same tasks you would have in integration service. If you look around here uh, into the, and by the way, those tas tasks here in integration pipelines, they're called activities. So if you have like, uh, uh, you know, if you have to do some uh, orchestration, let's say you have to call an Azure function. So we've got an activity here for Azure function. So it's not a task, but it's called an activity. And uh, if you are to invoke some uh, legacy uh, application that's running, uh, legacy transformation that's done uh, uh, done in HD inside, you have to do some high execution there and so far so on. Or start a machine learning retraining elements. So all the orchestrations that are available is here, and you can expand this, right? There are options here where you can write code like you would do in an in, in integration service. Uh, what else? Let me think. All right, let's go back here to the slide deck. Let's see what's next in my plan here. So yeah, so we have these guys. Perfect. Um, oh yes. So this is all orchestrating uh, uh, activities, right? It's all orchestrating tasks from point to point, uh, but not doing data transformations. But like I mentioned before, in this case in here, uh, before I can do any data transformation, I want to make sure that the data comes into the lake. So usually you will have this copy activity here that will bring data to the lake at some point. Now, this introduce uh, a, a particular challenge uh, that we don't usually don't have with integration service. When we do integration service, let me call my white or blackboard here again. Uh, when we do integration service, S, S, I, S, and we have SQL here as a destination. Let's say we have CSV files from a source. Usually, this whole this this is this CSV file here is on a server, is on a file server, or a file server, or an FTP server someplace else out there on the on the internet, or perhaps through a VPN tunnel to some place. But in general, this this source here. Uh, the access to the source is like in, in my on-premise network or uh, on an external network that I, I establish the connection. So there's nobody coming into my network. The SSIS is going out, collect the data and bring it in. So it's always um, on a secure and somewhat local network connection. Right, we admit that we, we have that those uh, sec network security rings, so we kind of assume that integration service is running on those uh, secure things. When we do cloud, that's not the case anymore. 
if my source is SQL, like I had before, if my source is SQL and I need to get that source into the cloud, and first it needs to land on, on a lake, right? Get it on my lake. Um, the pipeline, the pipeline needs to reach to my on-prem SQL, to my on-prem SQL. And of course here, there is a firewall blocking this, right? So that connection is a big no, right? Big no, no from any company, right? They're not going to pick a, a hole in my firewall just for Azure to come in and collect data. So like it is in Power BI, like it is in Azure Data Factory, and many other services from, uh, from Microsoft, from Azure, what actually happens in here is we end up uh, creating, let me erase some of this. We end up creating and deploying on the on-premise, here's my firewall again, uh, behind my firewall, right? On the on-premise, we create some sort of gateway. And the gateway in this case, for specifically for Azure uh, Synapse Pipeline and for Data Factory 2, the name of this gateway here is called Integration Runtime. And the Integration Runtime, or IR there, Integration Runtime, it exists both for uh, cloud sources as well as uh, on-premise sources. And when it's on-premise, it's known as self-hosted, self-hosted uh, integration runtime. And uh, that's something I cannot really demonstrate in here, but an, I think you don't have an integration service, but you do in SQL Server integration service, but you do have in, uh, in uh, Synapse pipelines and also for Data Factory. And that is needed every time that your source is on a private network, either on-premise or even in the cloud through VNets, you need to have a, a self-hosted integration runtime if you need to, need, uh, to get data. Uh, so this is an extra. Regardless if you have this or not, uh, we end up, in order to bring data from sources to the lake, we end up creating these things here in, uh, oops, my mouse, here we go. We end up creating these things here uh, in the source called the source data set. And with the source data set, let's create a new one. I don't have any here. Uh, let me get out of, uh, <laughs> out of this place here. So with this source data set, I come to see all the uh, supported uh, sources that uh, Synapse uh, integration uh, integration pipeline can read from. Now there is it is important element in here, which is the separation between the data set. So this is the source data set. So let's say I'm going to read from SQL. I'm going to read from SQL Server. In my case, uh, either in the cloud or on premise. Let's say it's in the cloud. So I'm going to read from SQL Server. So here from SQL Server, I need, because that my data set, which is going to be the result of a select, right? It's coming from SQL Server. So all the specifics about SQL Server data sets are going to be supported in here. If it's from SAP or from Oracle or from someplace else, all the specifics for those will be there. But that is, the, is just the uh, management of the data that's coming from that those sources. I still need that integration runtime that will dispatch, we are process dispatching the query from the service, which is something we don't have an in integration service because integration service is one process in itself. Remember, this is one of the most difficult things to grasp at first when people move from integration service to, uh, to Azure Synapse um, uh, pipelines. The, what's the element in here? Integration service is one process that does the whole thing inside itself. So we don't have the multiple roles inside integration service broken apart. So if I'm if I was to read data from a place to place, it would be just uh, uh, an integration service itself running. In here, because we want to scale this out as much as possible, run this in parallel, do whatever we want to do, there is always this separation between the process and the data that the process is moving or transforming at any point. So in this case here, the process is this linked service. This is the actual process. 
So I'm going to create to see a second new element. The first new element was the data source. The second new element is the actual process that's going to run that data source, which is the linked service. So in here um, is where I can come and uh, define my connection string to my data ser uh, services. I do have one here, I created one just for this demo. Let me grab one here and see if that thing works fine. Uh, where do I have it here? So I do have SQL, where are my SQL database? There we go, got two in here. Pick this guy here, got some data in. So let's go into the overview. This is my server name. Let's grab this guy and give that to the link service. What is it here? Server name. This is my server name. My database name is this one here. It's my database name. Go. Oh, give me a good name, right? And down here, I'm doing uh, SQL authentication, which is horrible, but you know, just a demo. <laughs> so SQL admin and the password is none of, none of your business. <laughs> so that's my password over there. Let me get out of the way here and let's see if this one goes. All right, connection successful. I'm able to connect in there, create. So this linked service is going to be a process, a dispatched process that will be invoked every time a query needs to go to that particular database. So I can have multiple copies running parallel. I can have a thousand of them running parallel, and each one of them will, when it's time to dispatch a query, will have uh, an instance of the linked service running for that query, connect to the database and running a thousand queries in parallel to the source, whatever source it is, and bring the data in parallel as much as the source can support uh, supplying the data in, in parallel. So that's the scalability thing we miss in integration service. We don't have an integration service and we do have uh, uh, in the cloud, right? And here, let me see if I'm lucky. And uh, yeah, there we go, got to the right one. So let's say I wanna copy this particular table from SQL into my lake, right? So this is my source, I got my source in there. And the same way I would go for the sink. Usually, like I said, the sink is a lake. So you're gonna point your lake someplace and you'll follow pretty much the same process, right? I don't have a data set to uh, write to yet. So here I would have to uh, uh, create a data set. And of course, I wanna write it on the, on, on the, on the lake in parquet format using data lake technology. And this one here, I need to create a new one because the one I just created was for SQL. Now I need one for the lake. And um, well, let's see here. Hmm. Yeah, I do have a lake in here. Oh, there you go, subscription. It will give, it, give it to me. It show up over here. Where is that one? I think it's in this guy here. Oh, look, it's looking for a Databricks workspace for some reason. And it's not going to find one in there because the one that I have in Synapse. Oh, because I use the data lake, uh, the data lake for copy because copy from external and or writing to external wouldn't be a data lake. That's true. Anyways, I would point, point it here, give, give it the access token. I do have a, a, a Databricks installation in that I'm doing some tests. This is for demos and it would be writing to the to the data. Uh, close that one here. Yeah, let's start this whole thing. And um, let's go ahead and create another one here. That would be my. Uh, oh, sorry. So, this one back. Let me get here to a link. Storage account. Uh, there is the link one, gen, gen one, and gen two. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna save you from the specifics. If you have questions about that, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I love uh, you know uh, following up on the sessions on LinkedIn or uh, Stack Overflow. Just uh, 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 refer to my account there on Stack Overflow. So getting parquet. Uh, there we go. I do have 
Play Air and Demo Workspace Depot Storage in there. So I'm going to write to my to the that's supporting Synapse in this case here. And uh, do have a browser element here, sample data. There we go. And I can store it in there, define a directory, uh, worldwide importers, and off we go. By the name is going to. Home and storage accounts. The yeah, yeah. data make storage browsers. Oops, log containers, sample data, and a directory. Um, to learn homes. The guy in there, back in here. Hopefully, oh, screen report. Why did it say screen report? Thank you. Right? All right. So there you go. Now I have source and this the destination done. If I'm if I am to do mapping of whatever comes from the query, right? From the original query, uh, my source in there, I select the table, right? And right into the uh, into the lake, I could come and import the import the schemas. And this again is something in integration service that is not really there because all everything is based on that file file copy or data data flow transformation. And in here we can just leave this uh, empty and we'll figure out the schema on the fly because Parquet Files is not a uh, schema bind. You can add uh, columns at any moment at, in there, so it uh, gives great flexibility. But again, no data transformation. If I am to do data transformation, like after I have copied. The data from the source into the lake. Now it's time to do data transformation. Then we do this activity here. Look at the name of the activity, data flow. If I go back to integration service, is exactly what they call what we call inside the integration service, right? Is data flow. So here in the data flow, I have a bunch of uh, activities, uh, um, not activity in this case, right? In, in, in the data flow, they are the data transformations, I think is what they call in there. Data transformations that are specific to integration service to get the data from the source, you know, transform, process it, and then write to the destination with changes. And if I go into uh, uh, the pipeline, into Azure uh, transformation, uh, Synapse transformation pipeline, if I click on this guy here, uh, which is the editor for the data flow, the little arrow over there, I will get, hopefully, it will pop up. Come on. Of course, it doesn't want to uh, live demos, right? Like that. <laughs> Come on. Let's try, try this again. This guy here. Put one here. It's two. Yep. Okay. Let's go here or here. Okay. Let's try around. I'm sorry, my browser for some reason is not cooperating at this moment. I am double click on this guy here, trying to open the editor for the data flow, but it's not coming up. Hmm. Let me try my browser on the outside and get this one here. Photo, photo, uh, Azure. Uh, well, this is the final demo. For this session, and then we open for Q and A. Just trying to get to for you to see uh, the data transformations that are there. So I do have here my Synapse pipeline, or my Synapse service. Let's open the Studio because I was browsing from the virtual machine. So perhaps there is something wrong with the virtual machine with the browser there. Let's see if it works from here. And uh, again, uh, by the way, let me go back in here. Yeah, you see this number three over here? It means that I have not saved this pipeline yet. And um, 
if I try to to save this pipeline to uh, pub publish it to get it in, in, to store that code into the the repository, it's not gonna let me because I'm missing a lot of uh, parameters in there. So just because of that, I'm gonna go in here. I'm oh, sorry, uh, in here and do a new one just to get the data flow. Pipeline, move, data flow. Let's see if that goes from here. Now, there's something else going bad in here that's not letting me do it. It's not letting me do it. Let's go here. Settings. Oh, there we go. Let's get this new data flow. Oh, there we are. Now we go. From that one, it worked. So here, you see, like uh, in integration service, I have a source and I have a destination. Uh, what is it? Sync. I have a source and a sync, exactly like in the, uh, what's the virtual machine again? Let me get here Visual Studio. Exactly like this guy here, I have a source and a destination. So I have here source and a sync inside the data flow. And if I wanna do trans uh, transformation in the data, I just click on this plus sign here, and this is the toolbox that I would have an integration service, but specific for the data flow inside uh, uh, Synapse integ uh, integration pipeline. So we can do operations like we would do in, in the regular integration services with some extra options in here specific for the cloud. And the compute of this one here will be associated. This is just the code, right? This would be like, it's gonna be translated into code uh, when we run. But uh, the actual compute of this one here goes, like I mentioned, into the clusters, right? When you get to execute this uh, pipeline, you have to uh, specify a cluster that will define, uh, you know, how big uh, and what kind of a parallelism you will be able to achieve with that one. So if I go here into uh, uh, the management the management of uh, Synapse, <laughs> sorry, if you go into the management of Synapse, I can go ahead and create my, create my Spark pools. And within my Spark pools, I can define, you know, how many processors and how many parallel elements. Uh, that's the number of nodes, the process are over here. How many processes each node will have. So like this one here, I will have uh, 32 cores per node, starting with 41 nodes. So do the math, one times the other. <laughs> And that will be has as many parallel servers, right? Virtual servers, of course, but how many parallel services will be with this amount of uh, CPU uh, uh, or computing capability would be processing data coming from the source. So of course the source would have to give me enough data. Or in, if I'm doing a data flow, it's going to the lake and work with all the data that is in the lake. So this level of scalability here, we just don't have uh, on integration service. But in terms of implementation of the logic, we have it just fine, right? It's uh, the, the whole bridge, the whole concept translates kind of uh, almost like one-to-one. -one. So we saw that, we saw the, the package and executing the package and all these elements that we have seen, they have some sort of a relating element inside uh, integration pipeline. One last thing in this one here is, the integration pipeline has way more elements than what we're seeing here. But to get started, you see you can really translate the basic elements you have in integration service to the pipeline. So that's the content I have for tonight. I hope you have learned something new about all of this. And uh, now I'm going to open for uh, uh, questions and answers if we have any questions there.